Our scripture lesson today is a traditional lesson that is read in churches around the globe on Pentecost Sunday from Acts, the second chapter, beginning with the first verse, we read these words. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them, and all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each of them heard them speaking in the native tongue of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language. Parthians, Medes, Eliamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and all the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds and power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You know, speaking about the Holy Spirit... In the church, it's not something we do very often here at Washington Street United Methodist Church, or I dare say in most Protestant mainline churches. And so we seem to relegate our talk about the Holy Spirit to Pentecost Sunday and Trinity Sunday, which will be next week, and focus on what the Holy Spirit means. And yet we talk about the Holy Spirit every single Sunday without giving much thought to it. Did you hear us as we sang that we believe in the Holy Spirit? All praise to the Holy Spirit. And when we confirmed the students last Sunday in this worship service, I said to each one of you, the Holy Spirit work within you that being born of water and the Spirit, you may be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. As I said those words to each of those students, I was reminded of one little boy whose pastor laid hands on him after he was baptized and said those very words, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. And immediately the little boy looked up and said, Uh-oh, uh-oh is right. We don't know where the Holy Spirit might be moving us out of our comfort zones. The Holy Spirit, the text for us today says, comes like a rushing wind and tongues of fire inspiring us to do things outside of our own comfort zone. Now, my friends, whether you know it or not, every pastor who stands before a congregation depends on the Holy Spirit working in us and through us to bring a message to you. And I say whether or not we know it, because the Holy Spirit is working through imperfect people like me. The Holy Spirit is seeking to give you a word of God through imperfect people like me. 
I'm reminded of the little story told about a young girl whose father was pastor of a church. He was sitting in his study on Saturday working very diligently on trying to finish up his sermon for Sunday morning. And his little girl came beside him and watched him for a bit. And then she said, Daddy, I have a question. He said, what is it, dear? Does God tell you what to say on Sundays? The father looked at his little girl and very confidently he said, Well, absolutely. Why do you ask? Well, I was just wondering why you cross out so much of it. Yeah, imperfect humans trying to listen. Well, I tell you, I do rely on the Holy Spirit every time I come before you, praying that the Holy Spirit would speak the word that you need to hear at this time in your life. I depend on the Holy Spirit working in me and through me but the Holy Spirit is also working in you to help you to listen, to hear a word that is fruitful in your life. And maybe that's why sometimes people come out of the sanctuary and they say to me or to other pastors, thank you so much for saying blah, blah, blah. And you're like, I, I don't think I said that. But I'm glad God spoke to you. Jesus tells us in the scriptures that the Holy Spirit will remind us of the teachings of the things that Jesus said and the things that Jesus did. The Holy Spirit will get through to us when we are open and receptive to the work of the Spirit. And so today, as the Church Universal celebrates Pentecost and that beautiful story of the coming of the Holy Spirit upon those disciples gathered in that closed room, I am aware that our nation is also celebrating Memorial Day weekend. We are here to focus our hearts and our minds on celebrating and understanding the joy and the miracle of God's Spirit with us and among us and the birth of the Christian church. And yet I realize, as Karl Barth, the great theologian, said, we come into this sacred space with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. We come into this sacred space aware of what is going on in the world around us. And so I wonder, as our nation calls us to honor those who gave the ultimate sacrifice in service to the nation's people, what does it mean for the Spirit of God to enter into the battlefields of life? See, the battlefield is a place of human brokenness, is it not? In its most tangible form that there is. When conflict escalates to the point of violence between nations, when groups of people seek to destroy each other, to end the very breath of God out of others. It is the most visible and tangible form of brokenness in our world. But it occurs to me that battlefields do not just exist in war zones. For battlefields come in all sizes and manifestations in our lives. Whether it's the battlefield between nations or within our nation. Whether it is the battlefield within our churches or our homes. 
whether it is the battlefield between cancer cells and chemotherapy, the battlefield in families that brings pain to everyone involved, or the battlefield within your own spirit as you wrestle with self-esteem or guilt or regret over things in the past. Those early disciples, you see, I believe were living in a battlefield of their own that day that the Holy Spirit came to them. For they understood pain and hopelessness, and they understood anxiety and fear. After Jesus' resurrection that we celebrated on Easter, Jesus walked and taught among those disciples for another 40 days. And then, as we mentioned last Sunday, Jesus left the disciples as Jesus ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of God the Father. And he told the disciples, now you go to Jerusalem and you wait. You wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like to wait. And in fact, I don't think any of us much like waiting. One of the hardest things about visiting a doctor and having a medical test done is waiting for the results to come back, right? Waiting causes so much anxiety within us. Well, those disciples went back to Jerusalem as Jesus told them to. But did you notice they locked themselves up in a room? They gather together and they wait and they wait and they wait. It was 10 days before the Holy Spirit came upon them. So Pentecost means 50th day, right? Jesus ascended on the 40th day, and they wait another 10 days. Can you imagine what was going through their minds as they waited? Did Jesus really mean what he said? Did we understand it right? What if the Romans or the ones who persecuted Jesus find us and hurt us before this Holy Spirit comes? Fear and anxiety overtook them in that room. Maybe that's why they locked themselves away, to try to protect themselves. You see, Pentecost is not just a Christian holiday. Pentecost was a festival time for the Jews. Way back in the Old Testament, we read about it. And so on this 50th day, there were Jews from all over who had gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate the Festival of Weeks, to celebrate their Pentecost, an agricultural festival that took place 50 days after the Passover. The Jews scattered throughout the world were gathered together there in Jerusalem, and they were having a good time celebrating God's goodness to them. Everyone was happy, except for those disciples who were locked away, waiting in fear and anxiety, feeling lost in that battlefield of emotions, until, to borrow a metaphor from an old hymn, Heaven came down, and glory filled their souls. For that little band of frightened, anxious-filled disciples, once the Holy Spirit came to them, they leapt into action and went outside into the streets where the people were. Their lives were changed. Everything for them had changed when the Holy Spirit touched their hearts and their lives, their minds and their spirits. 
And they went out into the streets. And the world has never been the same. God breathed life and strength and vigor into the brokenness of their hearts that day. And the promise of Pentecost is that a spirit-filled life can be yours and can be mine as well when we feel scared and anxious and caught in a battlefield of emotions ourselves. Jesus Christ, his body was limp and laid in a tomb, but the Spirit raised him from the dead. That same Spirit entered the disciples that day in the upper room on that day of Pentecost, and Peter, Peter, the one who just a few weeks earlier was so frightened to admit that he was a follower of Jesus Christ to that woman by the fire, is the first one to speak, proclaiming to everyone around the beautiful sermon that Jesus Christ is Lord and that they are to follow Christ in their lives. The Holy Spirit's presence in the lives of Jesus' followers empowered them to keep on doing what Jesus did to impart hope into the lives of others who felt hopeless, to give comfort to those who were lonely, and to bring healing to those whose lives were broken and battered by the battles that they faced. The Holy Spirit's in their, in their lives guided them guided them and gave them courage to speak the words of justice and joy, just as our choir sang today. Words of justice and joy to the people all around them so that others might experience God's truth and God's presence in their lives. And the world has never been the same. What does the Holy Spirit at work in our lives look like? Let me give you an example. Back in 1960, there was a little six-year-old girl named Ruby Bridges. She went to school for the first time, and she was so excited like most little girls are and little boys when they get to go to school. I'm finally grown up enough, I get to go to school. But her experience on that first day of school was not like her friends. Her parents didn't drive her to school in their car and drop her off at the front door or walk her to her classroom door. She didn't ride the bus to school like some of her other friends did. She was escorted to school. She was escorted by two federal marshals one in front of her and one behind her. You may have guessed why when you heard the year 1960. Ruby Bridges was the first African-American child to integrate an all-white school. Ruby had to be escorted by those federal marshals because there were crowds of people gathered along the streets, lining her walk up to the school. And they were angry, and they were upset, and they were frustrated about the integration of the school. One day, one of the women in that crowd tried to spit on Ruby Bridges, but she missed her. And Ruby just stopped, and she looked at the woman. She nodded, and then she walked on. Every day, those federal marshals said Ruby would stop at the top of the stairs to the school, and before she walked into the schools, she would turn to the federal marshals and then she would look back out at the crowd 
that crowd that was screaming all sorts of hatred toward this little girl. And she'd turn back to the federal marshals and she'd say, you know, I pray for them every night that God will forgive them because they don't understand. And then she'd go to school. There was a psychiatrist, Harvard psychiatrist, named Robert Coles. He heard about Ruby Bridges, her courage, her demeanor, her kindness in the midst of all that hate. And he went to interview Ruby and her parents to find out what it was. What would compel such a little girl to respond that way? To all of that anger and hatred. And he said this in his writings about those interviews. He said, all of my study of psychiatry and modernness couldn't explain any of it. But in home after home in Ruby's neighborhood and in conversations with her and with her parents, I noticed something. Over and over again, in home after home, I saw Christ's teachings, Christ's life, Christ's words connected to the lives of those children by their parents, reminding them of the teachings and the life of Jesus. And Cole said, as best I can discern it, Ruby's response had to be because of Jesus. The spirit of Jesus at work in her and through her. My friends, the spirit of Jesus is what the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives the Holy Spirit makes real in us the one who went through a time of trial on his own, a time of trial that no one understood at the time, a time of trial that has benefited so many of us. The Holy Spirit comes to us in the battlefields of life and gives us the strength and the courage we need to face the trials of life unafraid with confidence, with courage that we are not alone and that we will make it through. And that's what the church has been doing for over 2,000 years. Spirit-led mission to bring hope to the hopeless and healing to those who are hurting and comfort to those who feel lonely and oppressed. That's what this church does every day of the week. I am so proud of this congregation. You are a spirit-led church reaching out to people in this community in untold ways not only through the soup cellar where persons are fed and nourished with a hot meal, but through ministries of caring within this community of faith. Do you know that because of your generosity, we have been able to pay the bills of persons who have found themselves suddenly caught in a spiral of unemployment and health concerns? Do you know that members of this congregation are always ready and anxious to offer a listening ear and a word of comfort to persons who are hurting? As you read the names on that prayer list, and as you respond with phone calls and with text and with cards and with gifts of flowers and your very presence to ask, how are you doing? That's a taste of what happens when we live a spirit-filled life, my friends. We are aware of the needs around us and we are not afraid to step out 
and let the Holy Spirit move us outside of our comfort zones to give care and comfort to others. You know, there's an interesting thing about that story about Ruby Bridges. In reading about her life, I discovered that she grew up in pretty much put that childhood experience behind her, didn't think about it very much. She grew up, she got married, she had children of her own. But then one day she was taking her own children up the stairs to that same school that she went to as a little girl. And all of those emotions flooded back in her life. And she wondered, how can God use those experiences to help other people? About the same time, that psychiatrist, Robert Cole, wrote a book. His book was about the moral lives of children. And of course, he told the story of Ruby Bridges. And as people read his book, people started calling Ruby Bridges and asking her how the Holy Spirit could help them deal with the difficulties and the trials in their own life. Jesus says, the Holy Spirit will remind you of the things that I have taught you things that will give you strength and comfort for the facing of these days. May we each have the faith and the courage to so believe. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.